if you go out to the Times Square in New York or in front of Buckingham Palace or the Champs Elysees in Paris, what you will find is nobody. And you will feel that even in the middle of the day, you are in an abandoned city. But actually, you are fully surrounded by humans. They are in the zoo cages around you, in the high-rise buildings. They're just locked away. Animals behave very differently in the zoo than in their natural habitat. So I wanted to know how a zoo designer thinks about it. A friend of mine, Gustavo Colados, who lives in Chile, designs organic zoos. So last night I gave him a call. Gustavo grew up in Santiago de Chile. He was a bit of a restless kid. He regularly escaped to the foothills of the Andes to be with his rivers and trees and animals. Do you think that kids who grew up with animals in their household, they are better at predicting other species' behavior, but also other humans' behavior? Yeah, absolutely, because you understand that animals, and we human beings, are we are animals, we behave as biological creatures. We usually try to explain our behavior with ideas, with morality, but actually we behave in a very simple way. We react, you know, to, to heat, to the environmental conditions, sometimes social conditions, but we're very simple. Uh, I think we, we, we try to explain our behavior. It's very complicated concepts. And at the end, we are animals and we behave like animals. So, so if as a kid, you grow up with, with, with animals, you definitely have this natural perspective of co-living, you know, living in the same space with other, well, other creatures and you can understand them better. The zoos that Gustavo is building are very special. They are more educational establishments where conservation is the focus. And when you go to these, you are really facing the fact that you are an animal. You are a human ape, you are a primate. So when you are surrounded by several jaguars at the same time, and they look into your eyes and you feel being a prey. That's the moment when you really realize that you are part of nature. He builds these amazing new kinds of zoos. One of his projects has 100,000 hectares. It's in Paraguay, where rather than going for an afternoon in the zoo, you go for a week of hiking. I'm not that person that would pet many animals or, or my relationship is more, more with nature that's my passion nature i mean trees rivers wind uh, soil and animals but but not necessarily animals how come that you are building zoos if you are into nature not only animals we build uh, whole ecosystems that means rocks water vegetation topography dead trees live trees uh, and then we add the animals. What does it mean that you're, you're building organic zoos? We don't use any rules that are human rules. We, we try to use natural rules, never use symmetry, because in nature you don't have those elements. Well, how do you approach the idea of natural habitat but within the zoo? We definitely study the natural environment of each animal, and we try to bring as much variety of situations the animal needs variety for a natural behavior so we interpret nature we try to make i would say a copy of a piece of nature but in a relatively small space we need to combine different pieces squeeze them together to produce this environment that will look natural and that will feel natural for the animals if you are a behavioral scientist what you want to understand is the natural behavior of the species that you're studying. The tricky thing is that, of course, it's much easier to go and see an animal in the zoo rather than in its natural habitat, but it is in the natural habitat where the behavior is going to be natural. For instance, if you want to know why a giraffe has such a powerful kick, watching a group of them jostling for food in the zoo will not give you much of a clue. But if you visit Africa and you observe a giraffe defending itself successfully from a lion trying to kill it, suddenly you understand, gosh, that is why. Which gives a rise to the question, what is the natural habitat of the human ape? All our close relatives, the other apes, live in rainforests. And 
Many hunter-gatherers today also live in rainforest, except we are almost certain that our species evolved in a savanna environment. It was very successful and super flexible, so some of our ancestors had gone back to the rainforest. Some others spread around the world, including grasslands, northern forests, coastlines, island habitats, all kinds of places. So if I look at where our species managed to spread, the only commonality is that there is space. There's a territory in which you can roam around. Is there some kind of general pattern of how an animal's behavior is shifting from its behavior in a, in a natural environment to the behavior in the zoo? Definitely there is a big difference between the behavior of an animal in nature and in a zoo. And basically, is the lack of variety. In nature, animals are confronted every second with changing patterns of weather, temperature, light, interaction with other species. In captivity, one of the big challenges is to provide that variety. Actually, there's a whole science behavioral enrichment. So one thing that we learn from zoo makers is that you can hack the needs for space. You can put a species in a much smaller environment than the natural environment, and you can increase the variety of that space. There are some super social species like you and me, we're primates. All the primates, and almost all the primates are, are very social. So is it going to be different for them when you design a behaviorally enriched environment? Probably one of the most complex exhibits you can design is a, is a great ape. Is a gorilla or a chimp or a bonobo or a orangutan or a human or a human right well architects are trying to do that they have been doing that for almost five thousand years and I, I don't think we have uh, reached you know the, the stage where we, we can say that we design good places for humans we try to provide them with as much variety and, and options as you can also you need a lot of space for that you can you can make a lot of complexity inside a, a, an exhibit that usually we lack the amount of space needed. And also uh, the temporary changes are important. So hopefully you can make a lot of changes during, during a home, almost every day or every week, you have to change things inside the exhibit, both physically and also in the, in the schedule of whether it's finding food or, or smell or noises. But that is going to be true for all the solitary species as well. Yeah? So you are manipulating the environment. How could you possibly manipulate the social surprises? These primates and within them the apes will need some kind of social behavior enrichment, social surprises. Well, um, one of the solutions is interaction with visitors. Because at the end, you know, Big apes are, are so complex that they're, they're almost humans. I mean, they're very similar to humans in many ways. And many times you can interact with them. What we do in, 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 in life is that actually we behave, we do things, we act. And that involves time, not just build environment. So I think the way we live should have enough variation. It should be interesting enough. We should have challenges. The places where we live, our caves or our nests should be connected to other places where we, we can obtain other things like social life or work um, and should be connected through interesting connections to, I mean, a subway. What a terrible way of moving people. You know, in, in, uh, it's very efficient from the perspective of economy or, or maybe energy efficiency, but the experience is terrible, you know, you're right. This tunnel, you know, artificial lights, noisy. So hopefully we can actually do what we do in nature. We have legs, we have eyes, we have ears. Let's use our senses, you know, because that's what we're made for. The same trick as hacking the habitat when you move a species to the zoo environment, the trick of increasing the variation in its physical or social environment is exactly what we should do with ourselves in cities. Precisely. Um, we can make cities and, and, and actually ways, ways of life more interesting. Let's do a reverse translation. I describe a situation and you tell me which part of the history of zoos 
that those conditions existed. Okay. okay? Outside Oxford, I live in a very nice cottage. It's not a very large cottage, but in an acre of an orchard. So what is that equivalent of? I can connect that to a, um, a very nice exhibit. We have a big piece of nature, a big garden, a big landscape. You also have a protected area, a cave, or a, we call it holding building, where you feel safe, you're protected from rain or from storms. Uh, and when you want, you are able to go out and enjoy you know, a piece of nature that probably will have shade, sun, um, and food, maybe if you have a barbecue there. So that's a beautiful piece of nature that you have, a beautiful exhibit. So that can be a fantastic exhibit for an animal like, I would say a tiger or a gorilla in a nice uh, landscape immersion exhibit. How about your place? Yeah, I live in the ninth floor. Uh, it's a big apartment, but it still has a, a small terrace. I think this would be more something more related to a, a zoo from the 70s where um, it was very important to have clean spaces. Um, sanitation was a big issue, you know, that they wanted to avoid, you know, any contact with animals and soil. So they kept everything, everything very clean. So a lot of concrete uh, because they, the vets at that time, they were very afraid that animals would get diseases. And somehow in the, in the late seventies, some crazy people said, well, why don't we just, you know, allow the animals to go out. This was with gorillas, actually. Uh, gorillas, you know, are, are very endangered species and they were, you know, people tend to take care of them a lot because they're very valuable. So, so vets usually didn't allow them to get into the mud or into, into, into wild places in, in, in the zoo. So some people designed this in Seattle, Woodland Park Zoo, and, and many people was against it and they released the animals in this big landscape, this big garden that they created. And the animals was, were so happy, the animals. And they didn't get sick at all. Downtown Santiago has these areas which have apartment blocks, very small apartments and very high density, a lot of people living in these. So how about this? It's the opposite pole from where you live. Um, and it's, uh, it's very artificial. We have been training or maybe taming ourselves into the idea of living in this artificial zoo. I think it's really against our nature. I think for humans, the most enriching possibility we have is to interact with others and hopefully someone new, someone, someone you don't live with. You are designing places for apes. I mean, for, you know, for all kinds of animals, but including apes. And those apes are the closest to us. So if you are having an ape species that is locked up in one of these old-fashioned zoos in which there's really no hope, what would you suggest they do? Maybe you can change some, some behavioral influences, put them together with other members of each species so they can form a social bonding and hopefully have a daily routine that changes every day. Um, even though it's not politically correct, um, I, I, can, I have to say this, um, and, and one option, if you can really not change that situation, if this animal is really depressed, this animal cannot go back to nature, and it, its future is just 30 more years of you know, misery, uh, you can all, always, an option is to um, euthanize this animal, you know. That is amazing, because if I translate what you just have said to humans, and obviously euthanasia is not possibly the, the solution, but that also means that people should work all the way through their lives. I think that humans, we need to work for our food, our shelter, whatever we, we need, we need to work for it. Otherwise, you get frustrated, you know, because we have been made to obtain what we need only when we work for it. Can we turn this around a little bit? You are an ape. And you are locked up in a zoo right now, sipping nice wine and chatting with your friend, maybe behaviorally enriched, but still you're locked up. As a zoo designer, if you look at yourself in this exhibit, 
what is your prediction about the fears of this ape, about the tensions inside this ape? I, I think my fears are probably based on, on having a um, flat life. I mean, every day with the same schedule, um, without being able to meet new people, uh, to have new different experiences, to enjoy the um, speed and the variety and the, even the threats of real life, the action, the adventure. I think that's what, actually that's what I'm right now, I am missing. I'm missing the risk of uh, being outside, um, playing around with life. And that involves the nature and other human beings. If you were to look up here for another year, what would you expect? I would become bored, uh, frustrated, without motivation to keep going. Unless I really get very creative to almost force myself to have an interesting schedule every day. I think I would probably try to plan half random, half coordinated schedule to make it more interesting. Because otherwise I would really, I think, would, would lose motivation to keep going. Ninety-nine percent of our species history, we were foragers, hunter-gatherers, which meant that we were moving around whatever habitat we were living in. It is only the past few thousand years in which we are suddenly living in much more cramped environments. Agriculture first brought in villages. You can think of them as one of Gustavo's zoos, the organic zoos, when you are still sort of close to nature. And then we started to form, a few thousand years ago, cities. These are the kind of crammed zoos that we really don't want to put other animals in. But we do place ourselves in this environment. It was only about 10 years ago when for the first time in our species history, the majority of the human population lives in cities. And hence, this COVID-19 crisis and the epidemic lockdown comes at a very interesting point. Because we already are living in cramped conditions and suddenly we have to do social distancing, which makes a lot of policy sense, but which makes the zoo conditions much more unbearable. We are forcefully separated from other members of our species. The social variety has collapsed. I'm choosing these amazing backgrounds in my garden. Hopefully you hear the birds chirping and you see these amazing apple trees in blossom. And perhaps it brings you a little bit of solace. But the fact remains, the majority of our species is right now locked up in urban zoos. Variation is very important because uh, in nature, um, animals are exposed to an environment that changes all the time. Every second, things change. The weather, other animals arrive, same species are different. Sometimes you can be hunted or you can be hunting something else. Uh, so so you're, you're never bored. Uh, and one of the big problems with captivity, and this, this probably applies to human beings too, is that every day is the same. And for wild animals, that's terrible. So it's not just a physical frustration, but also psychological. We animals are made to be looking for things all day around, you know, making decisions, solving problems. So if you can do that in captivity for the animals, you will be improving their lives uh, dramatically. I think there's a badger outside. Wildlife is coming out, you know, because yeah. we're, we're locked. We're leaving there more space. Almost like we are in a river zoo, no? Exactly. We, we are locked up and then... Yeah. Do, do you think that animals perceive, could possibly perceive it so that when you see uh, a puma on the streets of Santiago or this badger here, do you think they have a perception that we are the ones who are locked up now? They feel like there is more space, less noise, uh, less threat, and they're using spaces they were not using before. It's fantastic. I mean, the amount of birds you can see now 
is sign on 10 times, 20 times what we used to see. So it's not that 10 times more birds just been born. They've been around, but now they can take the space. Yeah, it's actually reversed. I hope we can come back when this ends and actually have something like in between, you know, where we can actually share the space uh, and we can both animals and humans, we can feel, you know, comfortable. So I, I, I think that's possible. Are you suggesting that there's going to be one large organic zoo that's going to include us and all the other animals? Absolutely. That's, it's a great idea. Uh, actually, I think you just invented that, but I loved it. Um, yeah, I think we live together in this spaceship, you know, which is actually so small. Uh, when you travel, when you take planes, you know, and you see the world, actually it's a very small planet. Um, and, and there are very few places that are really wild today. We're already managing the whole landscape. So why don't we just, you know, assume that and we do a good management, you know, instead of being just harvesting, you know, and extracting materials, why don't we just manage it as, as, as our own garden uh, and we can all live together, you know, in, in, a, in a much better way and we will be happier. The last few weeks, so last two months, you know, we have been locked and we, I think we have had the time and the tranquility to think about about where we live, the way we live, and, and hopefully more more people and more people will understand that actually we can have a an easier life, uh, and and that easier life has to be balanced with nature. Gustavo told me the way you can enrich the life of an animal or even an ape in the zoo in a cramped environment is increasing variation. For solitary species, it is only the physical environment that has to give surprise. For a social species, it would need to be the social environment. The good news is that not only you are an ape, but so are those who you love. And you can enrich their lives using Gustavo's suggestions. If you live with someone, or if you can call somebody up, do that at a random time. And simply give them a little playful gift of your presence and you will see how happy they're going to be with that because they will feel suddenly enriched. What a wonderful world. If you find a solution, please share it with me and then we're going to find a way to share it with the world. Mm -hmm.